on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. If you have a problem, you lock it in your subconscious. Just lock it in there. And it's going to process and process and process and spit an answer out, you know. But it may not happen right away. If you've been around long enough, or even if you haven't been around long enough, but if you're an entrepreneurial type mindset, then you're going to figure it out like on your own and your subconscious is going to process it for you. And it's almost going to be like magic. You know, you just kind of float. And, oh, wow. Well, okay. So I did that. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Let's just keep going. <laughs> you are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high-performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. Hey, everybody, Chaz Wolf coming back to you again this week with another awesome guest, Justin Dawson. This guy's been in the contracting space for 25 years. He's an OG, but man, he's a go getter and um, a little unconventional. I love uh, just the creativeness that uh, he kind of gets into a little bit here, but his mindset is right on and uh, I think will genuinely help so many listeners. So, if you're at that seven figure mark, specifically if you're in the trades, but not even, you don't even have to be in the trades. It's about mindset and he gives a ton of it. So get ready. Here it comes. All right, everybody, Gathering the Kings podcast. I am Chaz Wolf, your host. I've got Justin Dawson on the King stage today. Welcome, brother. How are you? Hey, hey, hey. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, man. We, we were just talking. I got I to gotta fill in the listeners here. We we're just talking off air. Uh, one bearded man looking at another right now. Um, <laughs> but we were talking about seasoned, man. You've been doing this for a long time. It's just not your beard that's seasoned. You are seasoned. You are you are a, a seasoned professional. Tell us what business that you have. I'm a licensed general contractor. Um, I basically, right now, I was doing custom bills for like 20 years. Um, I've kind of switched to bathrooms because they're more efficient and I can make more money and I can get more done. Yeah, hundred percent. So you're in the construction GC world. Um, I think you've got a little bit of a history with uh, purchasing real estate as well. We might get into that, okay. but uh, excited for you to be here, man. Thanks for thanks for just being here and being willing to share. Thanks, thank you. I'm 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 happy to share. Good man. Okay, so at this level in business, you obviously been doing it for I think you said 22 years. Is that right? Yeah, I, I've been building for since I was 24, and I'm. Almost forty nine, so I think longer than yeah, that. Twenty five, but yeah. but I was but but I've been around it my entire life, so sure, it's kind of uh, a, a, a really long time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it feels like it's been forever. I bet. <laughs> it actually, yeah, kind of has, but yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, I even in in my short life, you know, I've done different things for different periods of time. You know, like one business, or you know, even thinking back to school, or you know, when I met my wife. Like, there's certain sections of life that you kind mm -hmm. of break down. But what you're saying is that this piece kind of has been one big section. Like it's like you've just been doing it for a long, long time, which it's I love. It's kind of been a backdrop of my entire life. But I sold real estate yeah. for 13 years. I flipped houses for 10 years. I was actually a cook for 14 years. I was, and I went to culinary school. Wow! So I wow! Actually, I was actually a sous chef. I remember they actually bought my gumbo recipe about 20 years ago for a hundred dollars, and they used it for 20 years after that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Such a cool thing. Okay. So my question to you now, Justin, is at this point, you've been in the game for a long time and you've made great money, but why do you push now? Like, why are you still doing this? Why are you pushing as hard as you do? Why are you here growing a business still? I mean, it's what I do, you know, it's kind of, um, I been pushing really hard the last few years, probably more than I have been. My son passed a few years ago. So work is, this may sound terrible, but work is kind of a therapy for me, you know, Sure. and it's yeah. something that, and it's something that I'm good at. And it's something that I can spend endless hours on. Yeah. And it kind of takes my mind off a lot of the reality of my psyche and how I'm feeling about other things in general. So that's, totally. the, yeah, it's so like, that's the answer. That's yeah. I, I think that for, well, first off, um, you, the first thing I heard you say was that's how you're designed, right? Like <clears throat> I think a lot of high performing entrepreneurs totally relate to that. I think even if I had all the money in the world, 
I would still be doing this or something like this because it's Mm -hmm. how I'm designed. I want to push. It's like what brings me fulfillment. And then you also, I heard you say there's freedom. There's freedom in the work. There's freedom in getting lost sometimes in the process of just putting your hand to something. Mm-hmm, and, yeah. and so there's value in that, whether it's actually the, the carpentry work or the, the construction work, or maybe just even leading your team. Is that, do you find more of that lost space for you psychologically in, in one or the other leading versus doing the actual work? I mean, I haven't done the actual work in years. Like I'm like the worst builder ever. So like, <laughs> I mean, so, so, so like don't ask me to build anything because your walls are going to be crooked, but yeah, I mean, I literally like, no, like I get lost in the work and it's, and it's yeah. just like, I'm, it's like, I make my schedule of what jobs I want to get finished and what I want to do. And then I lock it in my subconscious and I wake up and I go yeah. and, and then I get unlost and something's done. And then I jump back in and it's just totally. kind of a cycle for me, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. Just in one, <laughs> one sentence. I think you dropped like four nuggets. I'm going to try to reiterate them to the listener. I mean, we're, you're Sorry. already in here dropping nuggets and we're only two minutes in. Sorry. Okay. So first off, I heard you say you haven't built in a long time. Like that is number one. I wasn't surprised to hear that, but the listener might be surprised to hear that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so why do you think that the listener who's doing the work, it's so hard for them to give up that piece, like to get to where you are, where you're like, look, I don't build anything. In fact, you don't want me to build. No, um, I have a friend like that and he's insists on building his, his own stuff. He buys his tools. He's out there swinging a hammer. He owns six properties and he's broke. He's broke. Like he doesn't have any, he, he actually called me this morning cause he's got seven properties that are, that he's getting ready to lose, which is sad, but he puts himself in a $20 an hour job is what he does. Right. And then instead of paying four people $20 an hour, and you making two hundred dollars an hour, he just thinks he's better off making that twenty. Yeah. So I think that answered your question. Yeah, hundred percent. Because that's that's most likely what's keeping him and potentially the listener right now at the six figure mark, and they can't quite get to that seven figure mark is because they they can't think beyond number one their own skill set to start to hire, or even if they've started to hire, they've got to then press into that really and remove themselves mm-hmm. from those things. Was that a natural thing for you that you just started like putting together a team or was it like because you weren't a very good builder or was it because you just, you saw someone else was better? Like, why did you jump to that place and your buddy and so many others don't, do you think? Because I don't like doing the work for for one. Like, I I don't like it. Like I used to lay tile and cut doors and do floors. I frankly, I don't like doing the work. It just seems like a big waste of time to me. You know, yeah. Um, that's number one. As far as getting team together, I, I didn't, this wasn't my planned career. Like this wasn't what I planned. Like it just sure. kind of transformed. Like I was, and I bought my second house, in my mid twenties and I needed some help. And so my sister-in-law at the time had somebody who was working on their house. This was like 25 years ago. And then Arturo came, he's still working for me now, like to this day, like 25 years uh, wow. later. So, so like then Arturo came and then he, brought Martin and then it just kind of Estuardo came. He's been with me for 20 years. And then, wow. And then his brother Juan came and it's just, it just kind of all kind of, cause I never planned on being like, Oh, and I want to be a boss and I want to be a, be a <laughs> contract. I basically worked out of necessity and what made sense. And here I am. Yeah. Yeah. I love that perspective. I was just talking uh, right before, This podcast, um, I was interviewing a couple of uh, real estate guys who are potentially going to be on the show as well. And they said the same thing. It was, you know, one of them had a corporate job and it was almost out of necessity. He he had bought a house right in 2007 (laughs) Mm -hmm. and uh, and he couldn't sell it. So he became a landlord out of necessity, which then turned over this whole new leaf of buying properties Mm -hmm. and then eventually got into multifamily. And so maybe we'll be able to hear a story. But the, the point is, is that you know, out of necessity. And and it's not necessarily this, this big, long plan that an entrepreneur has to have. Now, you already told us that you make plans, you lock it in your subconscious and you go. So I know that planning is important, but what you're saying really from a grander perspective is I just thought differently and the pieces came together and, and here I am, but there were some key things inside of that. So that's kind of what I want to get to mm-hmm. some good decisions some maybe some bad decisions along the way that you did. So start maybe with just how entrepreneurship came to you. Like from the beginning, obviously you've thought differently if you know you had the perspective of thinking $200 an hour versus 20. But like, where did entrepreneurship start for you? 
I started working when I was 10 and I got like a paper route. I had I actually got three of them when I was no two. When I was 10, I had I had two paper routes. I had the Monday through the Monday through Sunday, and then I had a Wednesday paper that I would that I'll drop off. Yeah. And then I'll go and I would collect the money and I would pay my bill and I would have some money and you know I could do my paper out at any time I wanted to do it. And and then I would go and I'd cut and this was in the 80s and it doesn't apply now, obviously. But sure. Just I would different. Go, yeah, I would go cut people's grass for 10 or 50 for, well, it was probably five bucks then or something. Yeah. And then um, I'd get groceries for older people and they would pay me, you know, so it was nice. just kind of, it was just because I wanted to have my own money. I'd rather just work for my money instead of like, oh, mom, I need 20, mom, I need 10. And yeah. I wanted to stay busy. Like, I and, and I hate being stagnant. I mean, even like yesterday, like, I think I got done working at 12 and I was at home for five or six hours and I was just stagnant and I had to force myself to sit because I, I like to be doing something or something to do or something to, you know, it's right. just, I'm just, yeah. I'm just weird, 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 weird like that. Um, so then when I was 14, I got a regular job. I, I started working in restaurants okay. um, and I, I did the bus boy and the prep cook and the sous chef and the cook and the line cook. I did every single uh, place, play, play, place in the restaurant. Yeah. And then when I was about 18, I had a friend of mine who was actually kind of a street guy. He kind of made his money other ways, you know, but he was yeah. like my friend. So one day he said, well, Justin, we'll come. I'm, I'm going to come and pick you up in my new car and we're going to go get breakfast. And so it was him and all of his friends and me. And we went to breakfast and we just like enjoyed the day. Yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, like nobody had to go to work because nobody had a job because everybody was hustling. And so I was like, this is what I want. Like, I this don't, I, I mean, after working a job for four years from 14 right. to from four, no, no, from 13 to 13 to 18. And then I saw this different kind of life where you could have your freedom, not necessarily that I wanted to do what they did, but just their right. style of life, you know? And totally. ever, since, ever since then I was like, I like, this is and like, this is what I want. And this yeah. is what I want. And I didn't know how I was going to get it, but this is what I want. And then uh, new year's Eve, 2000, 1999, I had my fifth child being, being born in seven days and new year's Eve, I came into work and they fired me Dang. And, and I lost my medical insurance. I lost, you know, I had a kid on the way I was making decent money waiting tables, but I already had my real estate license. So it just kind of, well, I don't have yeah. a job anymore. So I have my real estate license. I bought my first property already. Yeah. And then it kind of time to from go, there, but, but it's like out of necessity. It's the same thing. It's just kind of, you you kind of go where you can make big money at, you know? Exactly. So I, I love the perspective of seeing the hustler lifestyle, you know, <laughs> and having the freedom really is, I love the, the, the distinction there because I think every entrepreneur thinks that same way. They think, mm -hmm. okay, how can I have more, but the freedom of less? And really the conundrum in business is that you have to press into more in all areas unto be able to create the freedom that comes maybe a little bit later mm -hmm. with the revenue and maybe some of the things that you're enjoying now of mm -hmm. having a seasoned team and having processes in place and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, maybe a little bit more money. Um, but right. the reality of it is that you probably had to jump in ship, especially at that moment when you lost your job and, and you started to had to you know, sell some more homes. You were, like you said, out of necessity, but you had to get into hustler mode. Yeah. I mean, it's always hustle mode. It's always, I mean, even I woke up, even I went last week and I know I'm going to need to make about $3,000 next week. So I went and I looked at a job at seven o'clock on Sunday night and I told her, I said, okay, it's 5,500 bucks. I know I can go there on Thursday and make $3,000. I can get this bill paid. You know, I hustled to meet her. I hustled to get the job. I gave her the price she wanted. We're going to go do it. You know, so it's always hustle mode. It's always yeah. hustle mode. I mean, like no matter what, it's always hustle mode. There's but I, I'm hearing you say that there's a love in it for you. Oh no! Yeah, I mean this is. I mean, I mean, like this. This is this is this is what I do. Like this, this is how I'm built. I mean, I, and, yeah. and I'd rather work twenty hours a day for myself than work two hours for somebody else. You know, it's right. just, and I, and I don't care if they were paying me a hundred, well, a hundred thousand dollars an hour. I, I might consider it, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, especially if it's only two hours, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then you set daily goals and then you accomplish stuff. And it's like, right. you know, got smiles on people's faces, you know, and yeah, 
you yeah, know, there's a, there's a big, there's a big circle that goes around when you, when you, when you're doing the right thing in business, that's for sure. Mm. And it's not just necessarily about the time, although the freedom, the time is usually why people get started, right? They, they, they see that lifestyle. They see the, maybe it's money or a car, maybe it's, you know, the freedom, like you said. Mm-hmm. And so my question is from that place, right? That, so what we've learned about you is that you've been a hustler kind of from day one, you, you've, mm-hmm. you've wanted to make your own money. You wanted to be self-sufficient. You've wanted to grind. You're a constantly moving individual, always an, an achiever of some kind, it sounds like. And so when you, when you really got started in business there, like when they fired you and you had to kind of like make it happen at that point, what was a good decision that you made in that process there over the next, you know, call it five or 10, maybe even 15 years? What, what's a good decision that sticks out to you that was so like instrumental in your story that would be really, really awesome for the listener to be able to, you know, hear and take notes on? Well, when I first started, I was just selling real estate and I was working on my own projects. And so I didn't want to grow past that. You know, I think towards probably the end of that five years, I think I did my first, I think I did my first job in 2006. So about five years after that. So okay. basically I was in, so basically I was in the mindset to where I'm not doing anybody else's job. I'm only selling real estate. I'm only working on my own houses. That's all I'm doing. Like I'm right. not doing anything else. And right. then people would ask me to do jobs. No, 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 I'm not doing jobs. And then my friend's like, Justin, why don't you come do this job for me? I've seen your work and I know you're good. And I'm like, okay, fine. And, I, and I'll go do it. And so I started doing that job. And then I learned that that extra income kind of filled in the holes between my rentals and my, you know, like flipping is a cash cow. Like you need, you got mortgages, you got payroll, you got everything. So essentially with no income coming in and everything is kind of borrowed or from a commission that I might get, it wasn't right. really enough to run the business. So when I decided to take on this other aspect of doing jobs for other people yeah. was probably the, one of the best decisions that I made. Wow. Okay. So what I'm hearing you say below that decision, because obviously not every listener is flipping or selling or, or doing construction. What I heard you say is that you opened your mind to something bigger than what you had originally intended. Yeah. I mean, it was something that I did not want to do. I was yeah. like, I'm not doing it. And then I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna do it. And then it worked out, you know? So in that moment, I'm so curious, was it the dollar that was like, oh man, if I do this, I get the dollar that of that amount. Or was it, I've had so many people ask me now, or like, maybe I should reconsider. Like, what was that tipping point for you in that moment? Well, the client was actually a pretty good friend of mine at, at the time. And he talked me into it. He's like very like persuasive kind of guy, you know, and he's like, bought a house. He's like, want to do my foundation? You want to do our foundation? And I'm like, uh, he's like, Justin, are you sure? I've seen you do them. I know you could do it. I know you could do my house. Right. So I was like, I've never done it. He's like, Justin, just come, come on, come on. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. I'll, I'll go. You know, so was there I, hesitancy there? Because like, Doing work for yourself and doing work for somebody else, obviously, like there's a standard there. And what I kind of just heard you say in there a little bit of him saying, like, I've heard, I've seen you do good work. Like he almost believed in you from an angle of doing his work, maybe more than you did. Most definitely. Most definitely. Because I was scared to fuck up somebody's house. Right. So, you know, so I was like, I probably, I don't know if I would say that I didn't want to do it, but I was probably more like a little bit more scared, not scared, but like apprehensive, you know? Totally. And he said, like, I know you can do it. Like, come do it, you know? And yeah. I started, I started doing jobs for other people. Do you think that that correlates? I'm just, I think we've struck a chord here that just, mm-hmm. I think so many entrepreneurs, myself included, mm-hmm. when when you get to that moment and you and you know, it's it's not that you didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. It's that you were apprehensive. You were scared. You, you didn't want to not perform. You didn't want to not show up. You didn't want to, you didn't want to fail. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because like on my own houses, I could make a million mistakes in the world and they were my mistakes, you know, like I could fix them, but to make a mistake on somebody else's house scared me, you know? Yeah. You know, I I don't share usually a bunch of my own story on, on these shows, but I think this is applicable for, for this moment of what we've kind of pulled out here for a long, long time. I prided myself in, I was the owner, right? Like Mm -hmm. I was a young guy. I had a lot of businesses. We were doing a lot of revenue. Mm-hmm. And it it wasn't just like like when someone would say like oh okay like you and your partners own all that and I'd be like no it's just me right and mm-hmm. like there was a there was an angle of ego there of like no no mm-hmm. I've done this which was fine there's nothing wrong with that but I'll tell you what what you're describing as the like um, almost like being open to other people seeing because mm-hmm. I I knew like I I was making mistakes we all do 
But yeah. like they were my mistakes. I could clean them up. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew about them but me. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so to your point here is that if I open my up self up to a partnership or if I open myself up to investors or anything like that, then that means I would have to be accountable. Yeah, I, I did. I didn't want to be. Yeah. You I, know, I, I did not want to be accountable. <laughs> I did not. I didn't know. I, you're right. That's it. That's it. I, and I relate to that, dude, because now what I'm thinking about in all of the areas that I'm expanding right now, mm-hmm. partners, like I'm trying to figure out who can I do a deal with? Not like, how do I do the next deal? It's who can I do the next deal with? Or mm-hmm. who's the investor? Or who's the partner? Or who's the person? Who's this? Who's that? Who's that? It's always the who now. And it has nothing to do with not being accountable, but probably it was just ego, scared, little imposter syndrome, you know, like, uh, I can do it for me, but not for somebody else, you know? <laughs> so you did that first job and then did did that like wipe away? Like, okay, I can do this. Or was it still like a little bit like, oh, I don't know. Like, tell us, uh, pick up the story from there. So we ended up doing a really good job on the house being, and the inspector was kind of an ass and made us tear the roof off and do it over again, which I found out later was a bad call, but he was just being a jerk with me, but that's all besides the point. Yeah. But, so that basically went the other way. Like, Oh wow. Like, and like, I'm the best builder in the world, you know, and I still don't have like that much experience, but I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm the shit. And then that was <laughs> the then, pendulum swung from, from way over here to way over here. <laughs> yeah. So then I go to my, so then I, subsequently I would do more jobs and I was the man and I messed up job after okay. job after job. And argued with clients and just kind of had a really tough time for the next couple, two, three years, you know? Yeah. And then I'm, yeah. And so I think now I've kind of found balance, you know? Yeah. yeah, I just went the complete opposite way, you know? Totally. I think that's how God has used circumstances in my life too, of Mm -hmm. he gives me just a little bit of ego boost. Like, (laughs) I believe in you, you can do it. And then I'm like, yeah, you know, and then and then <laughs> wham, just right on my face. You know? Yeah, ex- exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think everybody listening, if if they're not laughing right now at both of us talking about this, is they're not an entrepreneur. Yeah, you no, know? I mean, yeah, they have had these moments where, <laughs> and not and not just one, right? Like you don't just oh, have no. one. It's no. it's a daily, weekly, monthly, and and thank goodness for them because otherwise we'd probably have heads the size of the earth. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I even bought the wrong plumbing part the other day and I go back to the store like three times and it's, I mean, I still make mistakes, you know, it's just part of this because part of the nature is part of the business, you know, part of the, what you do. Okay. Well, since, since we're, since you brought up the word mistakes, let's transition to the bad decision. What have you done? That was just terrible. I'm trying to think there's so many, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say the worst, the worst, the market, this was in 2000 and six and the market was starting to it looked like it was going up early in 2006 by the end of 2006 it was completely in the dirt so i had this property and between ego and greed it so i i had a property i think i they were going to buy it for 648,000 628,000 which was a good price but that was a time of condos and you could subdivide your property and sell for $700,000 each it takes money. It takes time. Uh, the buyer was ready to go. I even told my wife at the time, I said, you know what? I'm going to sell this property. I have, the, I have this gut feeling that I'm going to sell the guy that I need to sell this property now. So I'm going to take this offer and yeah. sell it. And we're going to be great. You know, went against my gut, kept the property, uh, saw the greed Yeah. to get the extra dollar. Uh, and really it was what got another, another 50,000. It was probably a hundred or two, but it wasn't okay. really. So that was in like probably May of 2006. So I didn't sign the people's offer actually after I said I would. So I kind of didn't keep my word, which I felt shitty about. Yeah. And then by October, that property was worth 350000 And I couldn't sell it. And I owed 450000 on it. And I still had the $150,000 in debt to my investors that I needed to pay off, which I eventually paid. But yeah. um. Yeah. And then I ended up, the bank took it. I lost it, you know, but if I would have followed my gut on that property and sold it, or maybe I was practicing self-sabotage because I knew I'd be great after that. And I was so used to the struggle that maybe in my little mind, I wanted to keep the struggle because for some reason I felt better about it. Right. 
That's it sounds stupid, but no, it's a conundrum that I think that what, how you even just, just said it is so like I, most people have no idea. Like we we do it to ourselves all the time. Yeah, yeah. So that was probably the worst decision, but it wasn't from the financial aspect. It was like not following my gut and yeah. knowing what I had to do, and definitely a huge amount of self sabotage. Yeah, and that was probably the worst. De- and I never. It took me years to recover from that. Years. Years. The market crashed in 2006. I had 3 million properties go to, I had $3 million worth of property go to $1 million worth worth of property. So, I mean, and I would have lost a bunch of money anyway, but at least I would have had that section of debt paid. So the guy that I owed $150,000 to uh, about two years ago, he had a house that he had to do. I think I'd given him 50 or 60 along the way just to kind of keep him happy. And so I think I got him down to like 40. And so this was like probably 10 years after that or eight years after it was done. And so I needed $60,000 to get the permits for this house I'm sitting in now because I had to build it. So I'm like, okay, look, Dan, you know what? I know I didn't pay you, you know, I need $60,000 so I can get this done. But what I'll do is I'll record the note. I'll give you your interest on it within six months. And then I'm going to use that $60,000 to get my permits paid. But in the meantime, I'm going to get your house done with no charge. Mm -hmm. So basically I, and I got my permits paid. And I got him paid. I got his house done. We're even. It's like a fifty thousand dollar job. So it worked out. But yeah. I wouldn't have had to do that if I would have followed my gut the ten years previous. Right. You know? Right. But, I mean, but I, I mean, but then I wouldn't have had the opportunity to get the sixty thousand dollars for the permits to pay for this house that I'm sitting in now that I'm right. selling for one point seven million. So yeah. Wow. You know, it could be a bad decision at the time. It could turn into something else later. Totally. So I, I don't know if there really are any bad decisions, <laughs> like consequential decisions. But I'm yeah, there you of, go. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 you gave us the debrief also, which I, I just so appreciate uh, from you know from the horse's mouth there. But the the gut thing is so big. I just want to reiterate that for the listener, the gut isn't always right, but man, it's right. You know, a lot of the time. And you didn't say this specifically about the gut decision, but for me and my decision making, usually my gut speaks through the voice of my wife. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say that for the listener, listen to your gut and your wife. Um, if yeah. if both of those can go together in the same sentence. And, um, and then what I'm also hearing you say is that you kept your word. You held on to that relationship. You didn't burn bridges, even though you were in circumstances that didn't turn out the way that they were meant to, you figured it out. And that's what entrepreneurs are best at. We're problem solvers and you pressed in. You didn't run away. You pressed in. You figured it out. You got him paid for. You got him taken care of. And to your point, it turned into something potentially much, much greater. Like you said, you're about to sell that house for $1.7 million. I'm sure that you could pay him you know, off three times over if you needed to, but you've already taken care of that. So you're good to go. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So do you have any sort of like discipline or process when it comes to making a good decision now in your business? I mean, my thing is, is that I've been very reactive. I've made for years, I've made reactive choices because I was reacting to something. So now basically I'm just like, sit the fuck down, just just and, and don't do anything. And I just sit down and I just let it process and go in circles in my head until something kind of, until something kind of comes out, you know, because your yeah. subconscious like is amazing. It's like a calculator. You know, totally. it's, it's like a problem solver. You don't need to do anything. You like, if you have a problem, you lock it in your subconscious, just lock it in there. And it's going to process and process and process and spit an answer out, you know, but it may not happen right away. If you've been around long enough, or even if you haven't been around long enough, but if you're an entrepreneurial type mindset, then you're going to figure it out like on your own and your subconscious is going to process it for you. And it's almost going to be like magic. You know, you just kind of float. And, oh. Well, wow, okay. So I did that. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Let's just keep going. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, so, so, so basically what I do with like, so what I do with the decisions now is I just sit the fuck down. Yeah. I just, I just sit down and let it roll, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's so good. I, <laughs> I appreciate that a hundred percent. Um, I think that what you, you've described as your reactionary piece, it's obviously emotion-based and, and mm-hmm. you sitting down first allows you to process logically or even subconsciously to spit out information that makes sense first, mm-hmm. then you can feel. It's, it's not wrong to feel. I have these yeah. conversations with my, with my eight and six-year-old daughters. It's not wrong to, to be upset. Mm-hmm. It's not wrong to be sad or mad or whatever the emotion is. But 
it's when you act out of that Mm -hmm. first without thinking that you usually get in trouble. It's usually why I'm here talking to you right now, my daughter, you know, (laughs) 100% of the time. Yeah. So uh, even from business, it sounds like from, you know, 25 plus years of experience, you're saying, sit down, think logically, make a sound decision. Don't react. And when you do make the right decision, you'll, you'll feel that it's the right decision. You know, if you're struggling to make a decision, then it's not time to make one. Yeah. And, and that in itself is a decision and you got to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. Easy enough. Okay. Are you ready for the speed round? Okay. Let's do it. We're going to hit some questions here. One word answers if possible, but uh, I might, uh, might dig in a little further. Okay. First question is if you could only pick one thing inside of your business to track, what would it be? The, the happiness of my employees. Okay. That's a, that's a unique one. How would you, or how do you track that? When they're smiling, when they get a check on a Friday and they show up every, every day to work, you know, <laughs> and they're saying they're still with me after 20 years. They keep coming back for 20 years. years. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's like the biggest compliment. Okay. And you're here again. It's been 20 years. You showed up again. Okay, great. Let's keep this party going. You know, <laughs> right. Must be a good party. Is that yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. You know, you had said something also too, when we were talking offline, I wanted to bring it up just because I think it was just a really cool perspective. There's so many entrepreneurs that I've talked about when they, when they talk about filling the pipeline and sales and tracking revenue and all yeah. these metrics. Right. But when we were talking about this offline a little bit, you mentioned something that I thought just, it just it was something I'd never heard. You said, I track the number of jobs that I finish each week. Mm-hmm. And I know that, you know, roughly I need to finish two or three jobs every week. And it wasn't, your concern wasn't, how do I find the next ones? Because if I finish up all my jobs, you, you obviously have good enough work. You're providing good enough experience for the client where they're referring you, or you've got a marketing system down where new jobs are flowing to you constantly, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And really what you're concerned with is finishing, like crossing mm-hmm. the line, tying the bow, delivering the product to the client. How do you think that that's served you? Like just thinking back in the last couple of years, like how do you think that mindset has served you and your business well? Because finishing up your jobs is basically opens you up for the next opportunity. So yeah. like say that, you know, you got all these jobs, they're open and nothing's getting finished and somebody calls you with this great job that you want to take, but you're not open because you have all this shit around you. It's like, yeah. blah, 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 chaos. Blah, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> chaos chaos so and you can't operate in, and and the operate in chaos is impossible so yeah. by finishing the jobs you lower your chaos amount and you're open for new opportunities i love it yeah it's uh, closed and open loops um i use this language quite a bit and um i even shared it with my wife just a couple of days ago i said you know i've got a lot of open loops right now and i need to i need to get some closed yeah because <laughs> i'm because i'm right here you know like i'm feeling yeah, it's exactly. it's up up top i just got to close a couple things out you know yeah Right. That's huge. Okay. Next question is this. What book would you recommend that a six-figure owner read? Trying to get to that seven-figure mark. You know, I'm kind of like a spiritual kind of let things flow kind of person. So I would say the principles of Buddha, honestly. Okay. I mean, it's just, you just kind of get in the mindset to where like, because if you're stressed and you have chaos and you're constantly thinking about what maybe is going to happen, you know, or what could happen. Right. It's just like, I know living the moment is kind of a cliche thing. But not so much live in the moment, but I was reading a entry the other day and it says, operate like a log. You know, you're a, you're like a log and you're floating in the river. You're going to keep floating. You're going to keep going unless you rot or unless somebody snatches you out to build a house. <laughs> and, you know, and those two things you can't control. So what the fuck? Just be a log and float. And right. You know, the- <laughs> Yeah, that's a that I think that's a very peaceful uh, perspective to have. Um, I think that uh, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs are going to have have a difficulty with that one. So that's good. I think that that's good perspective, um, <laughs> especially high performers. I mean, they're just being. I think itself is a difficult task. Um, for yeah, a lot that's, of it, it, it is. It is. Just try to just try. That's why I said just be decision. You just sit down. You're not. You know. You're trying to push, push, push. Just be cool. Lock it in your subconscious. And between your coolness and your subcontrast doing doing all the work for you, yeah, you're, you'll be fine. We'll wake there up with a bunch of money in your account one day. I won't even know how it got there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Do you intentionally network or even mastermind with other entrepreneurs? You know, I don't do any advertising. I don't have a website. 
I don't particularly play well in the sandbox with others. My dog is great. He's, he's really cool. Um, no, I no. I mean, like, I don't, who do you bounce ideas off of? You know, it, it used to be my ex-wife. Uh, we don't really talk anymore. I had a couple friends that I would bounce stuff off of, but, uh, but, uh, one of them's not here anymore. So yeah, it really, is just, it's just kind of, um, lonely at the top. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) It is. I think every entrepreneur feels that, you know, to, to some degree, you know, it's why, it's why, um, there's, I mean, there's lots of opportunities to connect out there, but that's why they exist is because it is, it's tough to have these types of conversations with just anybody. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just don't, I just, yeah, I just don't. Yeah. I, I, I think that that story is one of a lot of entrepreneurs. They, they just Do you know how bad I am? Do you know how, you know how, how, how bad I am with not wanting to, not wanting to, I went to a comedy show cause I don't, I didn't want to like sit next to anybody at this comedy show that I went to on Saturday. So I bought myself a private table. So I wouldn't have to sit. So I wouldn't have to sit. So I wouldn't have to sit next to <laughs> you. wanted the peace while being in public. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, mean, I want to be around people, but not really around people. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want to sit next to anybody. So it was like all these people crowded tables. I'm there in the corner watching the show. They're like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy over here? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? nope. That guy over there. All right. Last question. Okay. If you lost it all, what would you do, Justin? Oh, shit. I've, I've already lost it all twice. I wouldn't want to lose it a third time. Um, <laughs> I'd find a way not to lose it all. I, and I try to maintain something. But if I lost it all, what would I do? I mean, I just, I just, I mean, I can always make money. I can always buy another house. I can, you can always fix whatever is broken. Yep. Um, it would just probably extend another 10 years of my job. And, and I've already lost it all twice. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, all you can do is keep going. I mean, shit, you, what are you yeah. going to go crawl in a fucking hole and be dead? I mean, <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Shit you go sit down for a minute, uh, take a breath and, and then go fix another house. It sounds like, yeah, I'll, I'll go do somebody's bathroom and make $10,000 in a few days and keep moving, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, keep, keep it moving. Justin, we, we just so appreciate um, just the laughter and, and the uh, nuggets that you've given to us here today. If someone wanted to connect with you, how do they find you? Social media, email, website, what you got? Um, my social, my Instagram is Dawson Family Farms. Um, my email is jrkd206 at gmail. Or you, you can just call me, uh, 510-821-2319. I'm pretty good about answering my phone or, you know, text. I'm pretty happy to talk to anybody, so. That's awesome, man. Well, we appreciate you making yourself available to oh, other and my podcast, The World According to Justin, but that's kind of not really a business thing. That's kind of more of a mental health thing because I think that's most important in business is keeping your men- is just keeping your mental right. Totally. Yeah. Say it, say it again so that they can hear the name of the podcast. Uh, the World According to Justin. There you go. Well, you, there are lots of ways you can find Justin, and we just so appreciate you coming onto the show and just sharing. Um, from your story, your your long history in business. Thank you for all that. We wish you absolutely nothing but success in all that you have your hand to. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for listening to Gathering the Kings. We hope you got a ton of value today and learned a thing or two about taking your business to seven figures and beyond. If you desire more and want a community around you to help you get there, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. That's gatheringthekings.com. And I want you to apply for our next Becoming a King 90-Day Intensive. We are extremely exclusive by nature as a group. What that means is that we're really wanting only the entrepreneurs who take their business and targets super serious to apply. So if that's you, you think you got what it takes to level up your business, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com and apply. And we will see you on the other side.